Good evening, everyone. Dear Professor Mary Scheimer, uh, good evening to you. Even though we are uh, in sort of a, a time gap uh, at the moment, um, the majority of us uh, are now facing the, uh, the end of the working day, uh, studies day, but everyone I'm sure has been looking forward to this wonderful opportunity to meet you and to listen to your talk. So thank you very much indeed for making this happen. First of all, let me start off by introducing myself. Uh, I am Andre Bekov. I am a vice rector at this university in charge of research affairs. I'll be moderating uh, this uh, event uh, tonight together with my colleague, uh, Dr. Igor Istomin, associate professor at the School of International Relations and the leading uh, researcher in the Institute uh, of International Studies here at Ngimo University. I will proceed as follows, and that will be the format of today's uh, event. I will first um, introduce our distinguished uh, speaker, even though I'm sure for most of you, or maybe for all of you, Professor Mishama does not need uh, a thorough introduction. And uh, then we'll structure it in the following way. The overall duration of this meeting uh, will be one hour, 30 minutes. That will be broken into two parts, basically. Initially, we'll uh, pose three questions to Professor Amir Sharma uh, that are based on his written publication in Foreign Affairs that we have assembled uh, today to discuss the inevitable uh, rivalry. And after that, we'll uh, open up uh, the meeting for the questions from the floor, from the chat. So please write your questions in the chat and uh, Dr. Stoman and myself will uh, pick the relevant questions and um, read them out for uh, Professor Mishama to answer. I would uh, also like to ask you um, to, when you formulate a question, make it uh, succinct, uh, quite to the point, and uh, don't make it uh, sort of two or three part question sort of compressed into one, because the best way to handle it is to pose very specific concrete questions that can be easy to uh, answer in terms of uh, getting to the core of the idea of the question and then pass over to the next question so that as many participants uh, can uh, partake in this as possible. So with this, I will uh, start by, first of all, expressing again our deep gratitude uh, for Professor Mayor Scheimer's acceptance of this uh, invite to talk to Ngimo students. I must emphasize that uh, okay. we consider Professor Mayor Scheimer a longstanding friend of Ngimo <laughs> since he came here a few years ago, he delivered a series of lectures that uh, is available for everyone to see online, uh, for those of you who didn't know about it. And we've been in contact for quite uh, some time on different occasions, so it gives us uh, a great pleasure to know that we have such a distinguished intellectual amongst uh, those uh, with whom we can check our assessment of the current international system and to whom we look in search for inspiration and better understanding and deeper understanding of the current international uh, situation from the point of view of international relations theory. Professor John Mayer Scheimer graduated from West Point in 1970 and then he served for five years as an officer in the United States Air Force. He then started graduate school in political science at Cornell University in 1975, where he received uh, uh, his PhD in 1980. He's currently the uh, R. Wendell Harrison Distinguished Service Professor in the Political Science Department at the University of Chicago, where he has taught since 1982. Professor Mishan, as you all uh, know, has written in extensively about security issues, international politics, the theory of international relations, and on uh, other issues related uh, to uh, international life, international uh, relations more generally. He has published six influential books, Conventional Deterrence, uh, which won the Edgar Furness Jr. Book Award 
Little Heart and the Weight of History, The Tragedy of Great Power Politics, which won the Joseph Lapgold Book Prize, The Israel Lobby and US Foreign Policy, together with Stephen Walt, which uh, made the New York Times bestseller list and has been translated into 24 different languages. Then Why Leaders Lie, The Truth About Lying in International Politics, and The Great Delusion, Liberal Dreams and International Realities, his most recent book, which has been translated into five different languages and also received several awards, uh, amongst which uh, the most prominent one is the James Madison Award, which was given to this, um, for this book to John in uh, 2020. This award is presented every three years by the American Political Science Association to honor the American political scientist who has made a distinguished scholarly contribution to political science. He also received honorary doctorates from universities in China, Greece, Romania, and in 2003, he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. The award committee, when they were presenting this award uh, to John, noted in particular that Professor Mir Sharma is widely recognized as one of the most cited international relations scholars in the discipline, but his works are also read well beyond the academy. And as Stephen Walt noted in his nomination letter, John Mirsheimer casts a very long shadow indeed. So for us, it's a great honor and pleasure to welcome you, albeit online again, and uh, thank you for agreeing to meet with our faculty and students. So with this, uh, I would like to start our first uh, round of uh, question and answer uh, session by um, asking you, how do you assess in terms of pros, cons, and potential arguments for and against. Uh, the US strategy towards uh, China upon the end of the Cold War. Thank you, John. You're welcome, Andre. Before I answer your question, let me just say it's a pleasure to be back at McGimo, although I certainly wish I was there in person rather than doing this virtually. And I'm sure you too would rather have me there than over uh, the internet, but so be it. Uh, and also thank you to Andre and Igor for being such good friends over the years and for inviting me to speak today. Uh, now, with regard to your question, <coughs> excuse me, let me say a little bit about what American strategy toward China was once the Cold War ended. Uh, it's very clear that when the Cold War ended, the alliance that had formed between the United States and China in the 1980s against the Soviet Union was no longer necessary because the Cold War was over with. And then, of course, in December 1991, the Soviet Union disintegrated. So the United States did not need China as an alliance partner for purposes of containing the Soviet Union. So the question is, what should the United States do with regard to China now that we're entering what is called the unipolar moment? And what the United States decided to do was pursue a policy of engagement toward China. It's a very liberal foreign policy. It's not realpolitik, it's liberalism to the core. Engagement basically says that what the United States should do is that it should help China to grow prosperous. It should integrate China into the international economic order that the United States had created during the Cold War. It should integrate China into international institutions like the WTO. And as China gets more prosperous, it will become democratic. It will end up looking like the United States. And since the vast majority of Americans believe that the, that the United States is the good guy in the international system, if China looks like the United States, we will, by definition, live happily ever after. So we're counting on China becoming a democracy, a liberal democracy, as it becomes wealthier. 
we are also counting on China becoming a responsible stakeholder in the international system. To put it in slightly different terms, we're counting on China to become an international stakeholder and in, in an American-led international order. So all of this is predicated on the assumption that if you make China grow economically, if you grow China into a wealthy and prosperous state, it will become a democracy and a responsible stakeholder and the world will be peaceful as a result. So that's the basic operating strategy that the United States starts with in 1990 and runs up until about January 2017 when President Trump enters the White House and Trump throws engagement out the window. Trump says no more engagement. Now, what happened between 1990 and 2017 is that China grew to be a remarkably wealthy country in 2017 to compare, compared to where it was in 1990. However, China did not become a liberal democracy. It did not become a responsible stakeholder. And instead, as a good realist like me would expect, China decided that it was going to try to dominate Asia with all that power, that economic and military power that it had acquired, and that it was not content to live in an American-led international order, that it wanted to reshape that order to privilege China in ways that the old order did not take into account. So what has happened is that China has grown more powerful and it is moving to dominate Asia and develop significant power projection capability, which of course is unacceptable to the United States. So we are now in a situation where you have an intense security competition developing in East Asia between the United States and China. And this is all a result of the policy of engagement, which was designed to make China powerful on the assumption that a powerful China would be a peaceful China and would be content to let the United States dominate world politics. Of course, a powerful China is not willing to allow the United States to dominate world politics. And in fact, China is interested in challenging the United States. So that's where we are today. We are in the midst of a new Cold War, which bears marked similarities to the Cold War that existed between the United States and the Soviet Union from roughly 1947 to 1989. Thank you, John. That's been very illuminating. Before I ask my second question, I must uh, execute a, a sort of uh, a request from the audience to tell you that you are the greatest geopolitical mind of our time. That's <laughs> the people speaking. So I'm just you know relaying the message. Now uh, you've recapitulated this uh, situation up until the present moment, but uh, how, in your assessment, will uh, the US-China diet evolves strategically in the years or decades to come. So what, what does the future hold in uh, store for us in terms of the US policy towards it, how, uh, the, how China is going to respond to that, and uh, what does this uh, eventual dynamic can imply for the uh, stability of the international system? Well, I think a lot does depend on whether or not the Chinese continue to grow economically in a truly impressive way. Uh, it's very difficult to be certain where the Chinese economy is headed. But let's assume that China will continue to grow uh, at a significant rate in the years ahead. 
given that China has more people, many more people than the United States, indeed, China now has four times as many people as the United States. And it's projected that in the year 2050, China will have 3.7 times as many people as the United States. Given that significant disparity in population size between China and the United States, if China continues to grow economically and the per capita GNP in China increases year by year, China will eventually be wealthier and more populous than the United States. And that's a way of saying China will be more powerful than the United States. The Soviet Union never was more powerful than the United States if you look at population size and wealth. The United States was always much wealthier than the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union had a slightly larger population than the United States. So China has the potential, if it continues to grow economically, to be much more powerful relative to the United States than the Soviet Union was relative to the United States. So this is, this is likely to be, it's not certain, this is likely to be a very powerful country. You also want to remember that the United States is 6,000 miles away from China. And the competition will take place in China's backyard. So the United States has significant power projection problems associated with this competition. So that's the basic starting framework. Now, what is China likely to do? What China is going to try to do is it's going to try to take control of the South China Sea. It's going to try to take back Taiwan. It's going to try to take control of the East China Sea and take back what they call the Diao and the Japanese call the Senkaku Islands in the East China Sea. So China clearly has expansionist goals in East Asia. But more generally, what the Chinese are going to try to do is they're going to try to be a regional hegemon in Asia, much like the United States is a regional hegemon in the Western Hemisphere. And I want to be very clear here. I do not blame the Chinese at all. If I were the Chinese president or the Chinese national security advisor, I would try to dominate Asia. I would be very interested in pushing the Americans out of East Asia. For the same reason, if I were in Moscow now and I were advising Vladimir Putin, I'd be interested in pushing the Americans out of Eastern Europe. No country wants another great power on its borders. And that includes China. China wants to be, for good strategic reasons, the most powerful country in Asia. And it wants the Americans out. It wants to be a regional hegemon. Now, as you well know, the United States does not want China to be a regional hegemon. And the United States wants to stay in Asia and dominate Asia as much as it can. So the United States is now pursuing a policy of containment towards China, not unlike the policy of containment it pursued towards the Soviet Union. The United States does not tolerate peer competitors. And the United States has its gun sights on China. The Chinese, of course, understand this, and they're doing everything they can to protect themselves from the United States, and at the same time, figure out ways to develop the capabilities, right, to dominate Asia, number one, and then also to project power around the globe. You don't want to underestimate the fact that China is building a blue water navy. China is interested in protecting its sea lines of communication with the Persian Gulf. China gets 
well over 25% of its oil from the Gulf. And it wants a blue water Navy that can protect those sea lines that run from China's east coast to the Persian Gulf. The United States, of course, wants to continue to dominate the world's oceans. And the United States will go to great lengths to do that. Therefore, you're going to have over time a competition between the United States and China that's riveted on East Asia. That's gonna be the main area of contestation, but is eventually going to spill out all over the globe. Again, this is a lot like what happened during the Cold War with the United States and the Soviet Union. So you have what is setting in uh, this intense security competition uh, between the United States and China. And if I can make one more point, Andre, I think that this situation that we have today is much more dangerous than the original Cold War. I think the Soviet Union after World War II was decimated by what the Germans did, by what Nazi Germany did to the Soviet Union. Furthermore, the Soviets had so much difficulty controlling Eastern Europe, controlling the Poles, the East Germans, the Czechs, the Romanians, the Hungarians, the Albanians, the Yugoslavs, and so forth and so on, that the Soviets were in no position to start a war against NATO. This was not the conventional wisdom during the Cold War. Everybody thought wrongly that the Soviet Union was poised to attack NATO and rush to the beaches at Dunkirk. That was not going to happen, right? Uh, therefore, you actually had a reasonably stable situation in Central Europe, especially when you take into account that you had two massive armies armed to the teeth with thousands of nuclear weapons. The situation involving the United States mm -hmm. and China is very different. First of all, the geography is just different. We don't have a central front in East Asia. In fact, we're talking about potential conflicts in the water over the South China Sea, over the East China Sea, even a conflict over Taiwan, which is the most likely conflict, bears little resemblance to what a conflict on the central front would have looked like. So if you think about it, you have this country, China, which was not decimated by the Third Reich, which has not fought a war since 1979, which is flourishing economically, right? And which is in a position where it might think about starting a war over Taiwan, which will not lead to a general nuclear war, which is what it would have happened in Europe. So what I'm saying to you is it's more likely that you'll get a war in East Asia between the United States and China than it was that you would get a war between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Now, my final point here, and this is a very important point, is that Taiwan, which, was, which is the central point of contention, the most important flashpoint between the United States and China. Taiwan is sacred territory to the Chinese. The Chinese care enormously about controlling Taiwan. At the same time, the United States believes that Taiwan is of enormous strategic importance for containing China. So, China wants Taiwan, and the United States says, you can't have Taiwan. And there's no way we can negotiate our way out of this Taiwan problem. And this, when coupled with the geography and the fact that a war over Taiwan would take place largely in the water and off the Chinese coast, makes this a very dangerous situation. Thank you so much, John, for this uh, illuminating, although very concerning uh, picture that you uh, brought. 
I just, before asking another question, I just uh, want to mention that uh, many people already used the option of writing their questions in chat, and we encourage the participants who have questions to do the same. We will come to this question shortly. But before doing this, uh, you just said that in your assessment, current situation is even more dangerous than the Cold War in the 20th century was. But as we are sitting here in Moscow, uh, obviously uh, for us, uh, it is interesting to look at the global uh, developments, but it is often seems that you know, the problems that we face are more concerning the problems that are happening closer to home. And many would uh, suggest uh, in recent weeks that conflict is in Ukraine is the most important and dangerous dispute for international security rather than Taiwan because this is where Russia and uh, NATO could clash, for example, and there is no role for China in it. So uh, the question is, what do you think are the implications of the picture that you portrayed to Russia? What, what uh, other countries, third countries, uh, should learn from, from these uh, relations? I think that in terms of US-Russian relations, American policy is remarkably foolish. Uh, first of all, I have never understood why American foreign policymakers, going back to the Clinton administration, don't understand that expanding NATO eastward and trying to make countries like Ukraine and Georgia Western bulwarks on Russia's border is going to be acceptable to Russia. The Russians have made it manifestly clear for years on that this is unacceptable. And it makes perfect sense. The United States has a Monroe Doctrine, which says that no great power is allowed to form a military alliance with a country in the Western Hemisphere and move their military forces into the Western Hemisphere. This was the source of American concern during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Well, if the United States doesn't want other great powers in its neighborhood, why should the Russians want or accept American an American-led military alliance on Russian borders? And the answer is they're not going to accept that. And the end result of this foolish American policy is first, we got a war uh, over Georgia in August of 2008. Uh, and then in February of 2014, a war broke out in Eastern Ukraine uh, and it continues to this day. And this is largely the result, largely the result of Western policy. And here we're talking mainly about the United States, which remains deeply committed to making Ukraine part of NATO. This is not gonna happen. The Russians are not gonna let it happen. It makes perfect sense from the Russian point of view. And why the Americans don't understand that befuddles me. It seems so obvious what's going on here. Now, to take this a step further, the fact is the United States faces a much greater threat from China than it does from Russia. In fact, Russia is not a serious threat to the United States. China is a serious threat to the United States. China is a threat to become a hegemon in Asia. Russia is not a threat to become a hegemon in Europe or Asia or anywhere. Russia is a great power, but it is not as powerful and as dangerous to the United States as China is. So why isn't the United States concentrating on China and basically working to make Russia an ally against China? Basic realist logic, I would argue basic common sense says that if the United States is concerned about containing China, which it is, 
it should try to enlist Russia on its side. But instead, what are we doing? We're pushing the Russians into the arms of the Chinese. Russian-Chinese relations have greatly improved over the past 15 or so years. Why? Because of American policy in Eastern Europe. So we, the United States, are now in this very dangerous situation where we face a potential conflict in Eastern Europe, a potential conflict in East Asia, and additionally, a potential conflict over Iran. This makes no sense at all. The United States should not only not be picking a fight with Russia, we should not be picking a fight with Iran. We should be concentrating on containing China. And by the way, just to digress for a second, it's important to emphasize that not only are we pushing the Russians into the arms of the Chinese, we are pushing the Iranians into the arms of the Chinese. The United States has pursued a remarkably foolish policy towards Iran as well as Russia. And the end result is that Iran is on its way to acquiring nuclear weapons, which is not in our interest. And furthermore, Iran is developing closer and closer relations with not only China, but with Russia which is again, not in America's interest. So the bottom line here, Igor, is that when you look at American foreign policy, uh, really since the start of the unipolar moment, it's quite striking how foolish it's been. And this is the principal reason why the situation in the year 2021, the situation today looks so dismal compared to what it looked like in 1990. If you think about where America was in 1990 and where America is today in 2021, you can only reach one conclusion. And that is that the American foreign policy establishment has failed miserably. Thank you so much. Uh, and now we are moving to the questions from the audience. There is a whole bunch of these questions and to be fair to the all the participants we will try to take one question from from the uh, person who was asking and if it will be more time we will get some additional questions from the same person but initially we'll try to take just one from uh, the participants and i will start uh, with the question by our student uh, gleb kazubov who is asking about recent developments. Uh, recently, the United States launched what can be called a parade of diplomatic boycotts of the Beijing Olympics. Professor Mersheimer, how do you assess the effectiveness of this step? And how do you think this will affect further developments of relations between the two countries? Yes, this is a great question. Uh, the United States uh, has decided to diplomatically boycott the Beijing Winter Olympics. Uh, it's not a complete boycott in the sense that American athletes can participate in these Winter Olympics. Uh, I, I think this is actually a remarkably foolish policy. Uh, I think there's no question that the United States should contain China. I, I'm fully in favor of the United States preventing China from becoming a regional hegemon. I think that's in America's national interest. But how you do that really matters. And it's important not to do it in foolish ways. Now, why is diplomatic a diplomatic boycott of the Winter Olympics a bad idea? It's very important to understand that nationalism is a remarkably powerful force in modern day China. Uh, when I was last there in 2019, I was actually struck by how nationalistic most young Chinese are. And of course, older Chinese are nationalistic as well. That nationalism revolves around what the Chinese call the century of national humiliation. It runs roughly from the Opium Wars in the mid 1800s 
until the end of the 1940s. The Chinese believed that they were humiliated by the Western powers to include the United States and Japan. And most Chinese are very angry about that. Now, given that nationalism is a powerful force in China today, and given that that nationalism revolves around humiliating behavior by countries like the United States, boycotting the Olympics, even if it's only diplomatically, is sure to enrage Chinese people. It's, ensure, it, it, it's, it's sure to push that nationalism button and make relations between China and the United States even more hostile than they already are. I think this is not a smart way of waging a security competition. Again, I wanna be very clear here. I think the United States has no choice but to wage a security competition with China. But I think we have to be very careful that we don't overplay our hand and end up in a hot war with the Chinese. And I think that humiliating them, which is what we're doing by boycotting the Winter Olympics diplomatically, is likely to make a bad situation worse. Thank you, Joe. So our next question comes from Dr. Andrei Krukovic from High School of Economics, and it goes uh, like this. Uh, perhaps you're, of, you're overestimating China's ability to rapidly close the gap in military power between uh, China and the United States. Other factors uh, besides aggregate GDP, such as the nature of dominant military technology, the offense-defense balance, the strength of alliances and military partnerships also affect the overall military balance. These may favor continued U.S. military primacy for decades to come. Moreover, the U.S. now holds a huge advantage over China in terms of military capabilities that it may be difficult for China to overcome. China's GDP has more than doubled Russia's uh, for well over two decades now, yet Russia is still more powerful militarily than China. Uh, I think that Andre is right that uh, there is now and will be for, and I'm choosing my words carefully here, Andre, for the immediate future, a significant gap, military gap between the United States and China, which favors the United States. There's no question about that. It's especially true when you look at things like submarines, which really matter. There is, in terms of submarine technology, an enormous gap favoring the United States. So I, I want to be clear that I'm not arguing that China is now more powerful than the United States militarily. I think that's not the case. The really interesting question is what happens moving forward in terms of that gap? In other words, if China continues to grow economically, and uh, translates that economic might into military might, how will it affect the gap? Let me say a couple points. First of all, with regard to technology, I have not said anything about this so far, but this is an enormously important issue. The question of whether China or the United States is the leading country in terms of producing cutting edge technology in the decades ahead is of enormous importance. We cannot underestimate how important the Chinese challenge to America is in terms of leading edge technologies. And there are a number of smart people in the United States who believe the Chinese are going to beat the United States at this game. And if that's true, if over the next 10, 20 years, China dominates in terms of artificial intelligence, quantum computing, uh, uh, superconductors, and so forth and so on, the United States is in real trouble. And that advantage that the Chinese might have in cutting edge technologies will not only make their economy 
more powerful than the American economy, it will also translate into military advantages. So what I'm saying here is if current trends in terms of high-end technologies, if current trends continue, the United States is in deep trouble. It's not in deep trouble at the moment, as Andre said, but over time, we're in deep trouble. With regard to the offense-defense balance, I don't believe in the offense-defense balance. I think it's uh, not a very meaningful concept for understanding international politics. Now, with regard to alliances, allies, the Chinese basically have no real allies in a fight with the United States in East Asia. Uh, I think North Korea is the only candidate, and I think North Korea is not much of an ally. So the Chinese don't have allies. That's not necessarily a bad thing. The Soviets had allies in Eastern Europe. And those, those, those allies that the Soviets had in Eastern Europe were more of a liability than an asset, uh, in my opinion. So not having allies is not that bad a thing. We do have allies, we meaning the Americans, vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese. Uh, you see this with the Quad. The Quad includes Australia, Japan, India, and the United States. But if you think about that alliance, you think about the Quad, those are four countries that are spread out all over, all over the planet. The United States is in the Western Hemisphere. India is in Southwest Asia. Japan is in Northeast Asia. And Australia is way out there in the water, far away from Southeast Asia, right? So these are the four countries. These are our allies. If you think about the United States defending Taiwan, I think the Australians might help. I think the Japanese will help. It's not perfectly clear in either case. So the United States does not have a robust set of allies to depend on for containing China. This is very different than the Cold War and the Central Front. If you look at the Central Front in the Cold War, it was the United States, the West Germans, the French, the Dutch, and the Belgians, all shoulder to shoulder on the inter-German border. And right behind them were the French. So the United States had this cohesive alliance called NATO where all its allies were together, ready to meet a Warsaw Pact attack, okay? That's not the case in East Asia. The United States does not have a group of allies that it really can count on at this point to help contain China. Maybe the Japanese, maybe the Australians will help over Taiwan, but we'll see. The United States is going to have to do the heavy lifting pretty much by itself for the foreseeable future. So I don't think allies really matter that much to the United States. They matter some, but we don't have a great advantage there. I think the most important, the most important element in Andre's argument to me has to do with technology. And it's the future of technology and what that means for the military gap and the wealth gap between the two countries. And as I said earlier, one does not want to assume that we're going to win that race. We better win that race. This is John speaking as an American. We better win it. But the Chinese are formidable competitors at the technological level. Uh, Andre already mentioned uh, that in our audience, uh, there are a lot of uh, adherents to your great strategic mind. And so you wouldn't be surprised there are questions not only about US-China relations, but all, about all sorts of strategic questions. So Makar Minshikov asked about one specific country which wasn't mentioned so far, Serbia is one of the countries with extensive cooperation with Russia, China, and the US, as well as the European Union. While the amount of investments on behalf of the West is larger, popular support for Russia and China is arguably higher in Serbia, as some polls show. 
Which role do you see for Serbia and the Balkans in general in international politics? Well, I think it, as far as the Balkans are concerned, there's no country, including Serbia, that has the ability to affect international politics outside of the Balkans. So I think the key question is what happens in the Balkans? And I'll make two points there. One is the Balkans was the focus of American attention during the 1990s. And that's in large part because the United States had no problems with Russia or Iran or China in the 1990s. But those days are gone. So the Balkans does not, the Balkans do not matter much to the United States today. We just, there's a, a, a saying in the United States, we have other fish to fry, meaning we have other more important interests than the Balkans. So the United States is not going to spend a lot of attention focusing on the Balkans. To the extent we care about the Balkans today, there are two real problems. One is Bosnia and the other is Kosovo. And Serbia is involved in both of those cases, but it's not a case of the United States picking a fight with Serbia over Bosnia or picking a fight with Serbia over Kosovo. I don't see that happening in the years ahead. Uh, I, I think Serbia is a huge problem. The centrifugal forces today are greater in Serbia than they have been, you know, since the mid 1990s. Uh, uh, but I don't know uh, what's going to happen in Bosnia. But I can't imagine the United States and the Serbians getting into a serious head-to-head uh, -head confrontation uh, over Serbia. So I, I think it's just not going to matter that much for the United States. Okay, now the next question comes from Professor Tatiana Shaklena, whom you know very well. Um, the question uh, goes like this. Dear Professor Mirsheimer, is it possible to suppose that one of the reasons for the US policy towards China after the end of the, of the Cold War and the bipolar order was to have a strong China against Russia? Uh, I think, Tatiana, there is no evidence that that was the case. Uh, I mean, I think when, uh, when the Cold War ended in 1989, uh, for the first year or two after that, happened, there was some concern that there might be uh, a resurgence of Russian power. But then in December 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed. And throughout the 1990s, Russia, which was the main remnant state, was in a terrible condition. So the United States was really not worried about the Russians at all as a strategic threat throughout the 1990s. Uh, and even in the early 2000s after Putin came to power uh, in Moscow. Uh, so I don't see us trying to uh, help China grow to contain a resurgence of Russian power. I, I just, I see no evidence of that. Furthermore, it, it, it indicates a kind of realist logic that was completely absent in the United States after the Cold War ended. The fact is that liberal internationalism, liberal hegemony was the dominant ideology in the United States during the uh, post-Cold War period uh, when it came to foreign policy. So I think that uh, the, the logic that you described certainly applied in the 1980s during the Cold War. There's no doubt about that. But I think we did basically a 180 degree turn when the Cold War ended. Uh, and, uh, and it wasn't until, you know, 
the early 2000s, uh, probably around 2005, 2006, that uh, we began to sort of see Russia as a potential threat, foolishly, I might add. I would apologize in advance to the uh, those who pose questions if I pronounce mispronounce their names. I'm I'm sorry. So the next question comes from Artavas Avanisian, and uh, uh, who is asking? As you mentioned, the U.S. hoped to help China grow as democracy and thus prevent a potential conflict because, as we believe, democracies don't war each other. So after what's happened, do you consider the current situation as a win for realism, for realist theory? And may I add to the question uh, from the audience, do you see it as an ultimate refute of both liberal and constructivist theories? Uh, of course, I do think that what has happened uh, is uh, evidence that realism uh, is the best way uh, for thinking about international politics. And whether you're in Moscow, Beijing, Tehran, uh, or Washington, that if, if you're smart, uh, you'll think about the world in, in realist terms. Uh, and of course, I think that any state that pursues a liberal foreign policy, uh, like liberal hegemony, which we pursued during the Cold War, is sure to get itself into serious trouble. And I would say that if you look at what's happened, uh, it is evidence that I was right. However, there is a counter argument to that. And the counter argument would be that we were assuming that China would become a liberal democracy and it did not become a liberal democracy. Had it become a liberal democracy, then we would have lived happily ever after. Because as the questioner said, the belief is that liberal democracies don't fight liberal democracies. Liberal democracies never engage in massive violations of human rights and so forth and so on. So the theory didn't fail in the sense that we never got to test it because China did not become a democracy. My response to that is that even if China had become a democracy, it still would have tried to dominate Asia, and it still would have tried to develop significant power projection capability that could be employed around the globe. And my argument would be, just look at the United States. The United States is a liberal democracy. It established regional hegemony as a liberal democracy. It developed huge power projection capability as a liberal democracy. You know, sometimes, Igor, people will say, uh, if Iran becomes a democracy, it won't want nuclear weapons. We have to have regime change in Tehran. And once, Tehran, once you get a democracy in Iran, they won't want nuclear weapons. I say to those people, look around the world. Britain is a democracy. India is a democracy. France is a democracy. The United States is a democracy. Israel is supposed to be a democracy. All these countries want nuclear weapons and have nuclear weapons. Why do you think that if you become a democracy, you don't want nuclear weapons? Right? So my argument would be the same with the whole notion of achieving regional hegemony. What country, whether it's democratic or not, wouldn't want to achieve regional hegemony if it could? It's the best way to survive in the international system. So my argument is that even if, um, e even if China had become a liberal democracy, we would be today where we are regardless of regime type. But again, I have to admit that we didn't test the argument in the sense that China is not a liberal democracy. Great, so the next question is from Nikita Lipunov. Professor Mirshana, in your opinion, can the concept of the stopping power of water be applied while analyzing great power rivalry in the Arctic? 
how would you assess the conflict potential of the region in the context of uh, the increasing NATO presence? Well, I think the stopping power of water mainly applies to situations where one country tries to launch an amphibious attack across a large body of water onto the territory of another country. To give you a specific example, just think about all of the talk these days about China attacking or invading Taiwan. To do that, China has to launch an amphibious assault. It has to cross a large body of water with amphibious forces. And that is very difficult to do. I think that the United States, the Taiwanese, and if the Japanese and the Australians are with us, those, those countries can work with Taiwan to make it extremely difficult for China to land on Taiwan and conquer Taiwan. That's the stopping power of water. If you go to the Arctic, I don't see that scenario playing out. I think there's no question that there could be a conflict in the Arctic involving the United States and maybe Russia, uh, maybe even China, because the Chinese have deep interests in the Arctic. But I think that it is less likely there that the stopping power of water will matter. I believe that the next question to a degree follows uh, the one that I've read uh, to you previously. It's the question from Niels Holger, uh, who is asking, Professor Mersheim, throughout the early 2000s, there has been a general movement away from structural realism. Schwerer asserted that neoclassical theory represents the future, while you and Stephen Walt in 2013 noted that the general trend away from theory in international relations, the international relations studies to pure quantitative, study, quantitative analysis. Uh, as current trajectories in international politics seem to again provide evidence supporting the assertions of structural theories, what does the future hold for structural realism and realist IR theory in general? Okay, let me make a number of points. Uh, Steve Walt and I wrote this piece uh, that the questioner referred to called Leaving Theory Behind in 2013, where as he correctly pointed out, we emphasized that scholars in the United States had lost interest in good part in theory and had become much more interested in testing hypotheses, in doing empirical work. And we argued that this was a fundamental mistake. We argued that testing theories or testing hypotheses is important, but theory is God. That's my rhetoric. Theory is God and theory is the most important part of our enterprise. And it was regretful that theory was being left behind. I think that is still the case, by the way. I think that theory uh, does not have place of privilege uh, in the international relations world in the United States, uh, for sure. Uh, I think the article that we wrote in 2013 is as relevant today as it was then. We say a few words about realism. Realism is deeply disliked in the United States. The United States is a fundamentally liberal country that dislikes realism from the get-go. Countries like Russia and countries like China are much more friendly to my thinking about international politics than the United States. If I come to Moscow or I go to Beijing and I talk to scholars and uh, journalists and policymakers about international politics. I find Russians and Chinese 
much more simpatico than I find Americans. Because again, most Americans are liberal to the core and they really dislike realism. Uh, I think, however, today, now that the unipolar moment is over and the United States is involved in a security competition with China and is involved in a potential conflict situation with Russia in Eastern Europe, and is even thinking about a possible war with Iran, that realism is back on the table in ways that was not the case during the unipolar moment when liberal hegemony dominated. So realism has made something of a comeback in the United States. Although again, you never want to underestimate the dislike of realism here in the United States. My final point has to do with structural realism versus neoclassical liberalism, and, excuse me, neoclassical realism. Uh, if, if Americans or American scholars don't like realism, what they really loathe or really dislike is structural realism. Uh, and the reason that most American scholars loathe structural realism is because it takes agency out of the story. It says that individuals don't matter. For example, a lot of people think that the reason we have trouble with China today is because of Xi Jinping, or the reason that we have trouble with Russia today is because of Vladimir Putin. And if you get rid of Xi, you get rid of Putin and get responsible leaders in there, we'll all live happily ever after. This is, a, this is a story that privileges agency. John's story is a structural story. From my perspective, it doesn't matter whether Putin is running Russian foreign policy or Andre or Igor is running Russian foreign policy. The end result would be largely the same. And the same thing is true with regard to China. If you put me in charge in China instead of Xi Jinping, the end result would be the same. Structure is the dominant factor in shaping a country's foreign policy. Agency does not matter. This is an argument that most academics recoil at. Neoclassical realism, which says structure matters, but everything else matters. Individuals matter, uh, domestic politics matters, bureaucratic politics matters, culture matters, right? Everything matters with neoclassical realism, including structure, but structure doesn't matter that much. That's a theory that Americans are gonna be much more comfortable with. If they have to tolerate realism, I mean, they, they don't like realism, but if they have to tolerate it, they'll take the neoclassical version every time. Structural realism, they dislike. And as you all know, within the world of structural realism, there are offensive realists like me and defensive realists. And there's nothing worse than the offensive realists like me. People who believe that structure gives states incentives to be aggressive, to maximize their power. The defensive realists tell a much happier story. So if you have to swallow structural realism, you'll take the defensive variant over the offensive variant every time. So as you can see, someone like me, who privileges theory, who privileges realism, who privileges structural realism, and who privileges offensive realism, is not going to be an individual who has many followers. Great. So the next question is from Samuel Vasapolo. Rumor has it that the United States and NATO would not be capable of fighting efficiently on two fronts. This two fronts challenge posed by Russia and China is a major difference with the US, China, with the US Russia Cold War, during which Europe was the only real battlefield for global hegemony. So, should the US and Russia balance against China before it is too late? Uh, let me say two things. First, just let me talk about the Soviet Union. Soviet Union you want to remember, uh, was an Asian power, Northeast Asia, 
as well as a European power. And furthermore, because it included countries like Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and so forth and so on, it was adjacent to Iran, and it had the capability to move into the greater Middle East, right? So the Soviet Union was a country that the United States thought about fighting on three different fronts. Central Europe, which of course was the most important front, that's the central front, East Asia, mainly Northeast Asia, and the Persian Gulf. When the United States developed the rapid deployment force starting in 1979 to deploy forces rapidly to the Middle East, it was designed in large part to deal with the Soviet invasion of Iran. Whether you think that was realistic or not is another matter. The point is that the Soviet Union, because of its geographical location, right, presented a threat to the United States on three separate fronts. China is a very different case. China is a threat in East Asia, but only in East Asia at this point in time. It's not a Eurasian threat the way the Soviet Union was a Eurasian threat. So that's point one. Point two is putting all of that aside, there is no question that the United States could end up let's hope this doesn't happen, fighting a war in Eastern Europe at the same time it fights a war in um, East Asia. That's the two front war problem. I believe this would be disastrous for the United States. I think even if the United States had to fight one war in Eastern Europe, it would be in deep trouble. I think the Russians have all sorts of advantages, mainly for geographical reasons over the Americans in a fight, let's say over the Baltic States or over Ukraine. The United States would be really in an incredibly tough fight if it ever got into a conflict with Russia uh, in Eastern Europe. That's just that scenario alone. If you then throw in a fight over Taiwan, uh, we would be in terrible shape. This brings me to my final point. If you think about it, the United States would be crazy to pick a fight in Eastern Europe with Russia, not only because it would have disastrous consequences in Eastern Europe, It'd be a tough fight to win. It's hard to imagine what winning would mean for the Americans. Not only that, but what would be the consequences for the Chinese? If you're Chinese, you're the Chinese, and you see the Americans bogged down in a war in Eastern Europe, isn't this the time to take Taiwan? Isn't this the time to expand in the East China Sea and in the South China Sea? I would think so. I think that if you saw the Americans bogged down in Eastern Europe, the time to act on your interests in East Asia would be now, not later. So I think the United States, for a variety of reasons, has a deep-seated interest of getting out of East Europe, repairing its relations with the Russians, and concentrating on East Asia, where there is a peer competitor called China. Uh, so the audience is still, still very interested about the domestic developments in China. And Vladimir Ashkotov is asking you, you said that in the 1990s, the American politicians believed that if China becomes richer and more pro prosperous, it would turn into a liberal democracy. But even now, the income of most Chinese is much lower than of Japanese and Koreans. So we, Vladimir asks, maybe China is still not prosperous enough to become a democracy. Uh there is an argument to be made which goes along those lines. And that is that China has not become a democracy, but it takes time and it will eventually become a democracy. Uh, and one could argue <laughs> as the questioner did that as 
China's per capita GNP increases as the average Chinese person becomes wealthier, that person will demand political influence in the Chinese political process. And the end result will be you'll get democracy. Uh, can I say that will never happen? No, I, I can't say that. Uh, as I said to you before, I don't think it matters whether it happens or not. I don't think that democratic peace theory holds. Uh, so it doesn't matter to me, but it may become a democracy. Let me say one more thing about this whole issue. I, I think it's a very American centric or Western centric view of the world. We believe in the United States, this does not include me. I wanna be clear, it does not include me. It includes the vast majority of Americans and West Europeans. We believe that there's only one correct political system and that's liberal democracy. And that it's natural for everybody to want to have a political system that looks like the American political system. It's just very important to understand that. Uh, if you go back to Francis Fukuyama's very famous piece, The End of History, the Fukuyama argument was that the United States had fought fascism in the first half of the 20th century and won. It fought communism in the second half of the 20th century and won. And the argument was that the future was a planet occupied by nothing but liberal democracies. Frank Fukuyama's argument was that we were moving towards a world filled with states that looked like the United States. He believed that liberal democracy had the wind at its back. Now, the fact is that there are countries in the world that don't like liberal democracy that they prefer a different political system. Sometimes that's authoritarianism, sometimes that's communism, sometimes that's fascism, just to pick three examples. Liberal democracy is not every country's favorite political system, but the Americans don't understand that. And they think that they should be running around the world doing social engineering and turning countries into liberal democracies. As you and Russia know, this is what the color revolutions were all about. The color revolutions, the orange revolution in Ukraine, the rose revolution in Georgia, were designed to turn those countries into democracy. And when Michael McFaul was the US ambassador to Russia, he was interested in affecting a color revolution inside of Russia. This is, in my opinion, a remarkably foolish way to think about international politics. The fact is that the Russians, the Ukrainians, the Georgians, the Chinese, they may have different views on what kind of political system they want. And I think that it makes much more sense for the United States not to interfere in the domestic politics of other countries and to let them have the kind of political system they want to have. But selling that argument in the United States is remarkably difficult because there's a degree of chauvinism in the American perspective that is hard to uh, underestimate. Uh, and it basically sees liberal democracy uh, as by far the best political system and one that everybody else really wants. Right, so a question from Keith Budd. Professor Mearsheimer, do you think that the demographic pyramid of an aging China, particularly the long-term effects of the one-child policy, will restrict China's ability to wage a superpower conflict? I think uh, the uh, demographic problems that China faces are, are significant. Uh, I, I note, by the way, that South Korea and Japan face similar demographic problems. 
And South Korea, as best I can tell, now has the lowest birth rate in the world. Um, it's also important to understand that the US birth rate um, is declining. Uh, we are well under replacement level now, and there's no evidence that's gonna change. Russia, of course, is facing a similar situation. Uh, if you go to Europe, Germany is now by far the most populous country in Europe. Uh, by the year 2050, Germany will have roughly the same size population as France and Britain. Uh, so demographics uh, really matter. And uh, if you look at China, it's got big problems moving forward. Uh, what are the consequences of this? Let me make two points. One, I think that there's no question that uh, in the second half of this century, uh, China's power will begin to shrink uh, because of its declining population. Uh, I think between now and 2050, uh, it will not have that significant effect, uh, but I think it will have a really significant effect in the second half of this century. Uh, I think the one child policy um, will create uh, huge problems uh, moving forward, uh, but not for a while. Uh, now, what about the Americans? The great advantage that the United States has here is that it's an immigrant culture. Uh, the fact is that Donald Trump notwithstanding, the United States can open the gates and bring in more immigrants. So even though the United States uh, uh, has a declining birth rate and is well under 2.1 women, 2.1 babies per women, which is replacement rate. The United States can go a long way towards uh, obviating that problem, negating that problem uh, through immigration. Uh, so I, I think what you'll see in the case of the United States is more and more immigration over time to compensate for the declining birth rate. Therefore, I think you can make a case that in the second half of the 21st century, once we begin to get into the decades after 2050, uh, the gap between the United States and China will shift in America's favor, largely for demographic reasons. Uh, the Chinese are not China is not an immigrant culture. Uh, they're not going to be able to import people the way the United States does. So I think this will be a significant advantage for the United States uh, moving forward. The next question comes from uh, Igor Spirin, uh, and he cites the US debates about defending Taiwan, whether the United States should defend Taiwan if the China attacks it or not. What is your position on this issue? Okay, uh, I'll make two points uh, and to summarize them quickly, we will defend Taiwan and we should defend Taiwan. First on whether we will defend Taiwan, there's a big public debate in the United States on whether we will defend Taiwan. Uh, I believe this is a meaningless debate. We're going to defend Taiwan. Uh, the train has already left the station on this one. Uh, the deep state is committed to defending Taiwan. Uh, the idea that the United States would allow China to take Taiwan and just sit there and let it happen, not going to happen. Not going to happen. We're going to move in to help Taiwan defend itself. And this brings me to the second question, which is whether we should, and I'll tell you why we should, which I think helps explain why we will. We should defend Taiwan for two very important strategic reasons. First of all, if we don't defend Taiwan, right, and we allow Taiwan to be conquered by China, we stand there and let it happen, this would have devastating consequences on our alliances in East Asia, our alliances with 
South Korea, Japan, the Philippines, Australia, India, and so forth and so on. Uh, we're just not going to let that happen. Nobody would be able to rely on us in East Asia if we wrote off Taiwan. Second is that Taiwan is very important. Controlling Taiwan is very important for the United States for purposes of bottling up the Chinese Navy inside the first island chain. If you look at uh, the geography in the Western Pacific, right up against the Chinese coastline, this is the east, Eastern coastline of China. There's the first island chain, and then there's the second island chain. And what the United States wants to do is it wants to bottle up the Chinese Navy and Chinese Air Forces inside the first island chain. Taiwan is part of the first island chain. And controlling Taiwan is of enormous importance for preventing the Chinese military from breaking out of the line that is comprised by that first island chain. The Japanese care enormously about Taiwan. The Japanese took Taiwan from China in 1895 for good strategic reasons, and they're deeply committed today to keeping Taiwan because they understand it's essential for bottling up Chinese naval and air forces inside the first island chain. So that factor coupled with my earlier point about the consequences for our alliances in East Asia make it imperative that we defend Taiwan. So my argument is we will defend Taiwan, period, and we should defend Taiwan, and that's why we will defend Taiwan. Okay, so I guess one of the last questions, or maybe the last one from Yulia Melnikova. Professor Mirshana, where do you see the EU in the new transforming world order? What do European strategic interests and intentions amidst the US-China rivalry look like to you? Should we expect total balancing or something else in the long run? This is a great question. Um, first of all, it is important to emphasize that, uh, that Europe or the EU is not a country, <laughs> that Europe is comprised of a number of countries. Uh, and, uh, and they, they tend to have different interests. There's no question that the British and the French have made some moves to indicate that they're willing to help us deal with the China threat, that they're willing to help us contain China. I think everybody's heard about, heard of AUKUS, A-U, uh, K, uh, S, this is Australia, the UK, and the US, A, UK, US, AUKUS. Uh, the fact that the UK or Great Britain is involved in this alliance structure sort of indicates that Britain, Australia, and the United States are working together against China, and they're interested in, the British are interested in helping us contain China. Uh, the fact is the British and the French can only play a tiny role in helping us contain China. They just don't have the power projection capability and they're physically or geographically too far away. So France and Britain are not gonna be meaningful partners of the United States in a containment policy in East Asia, not gonna happen, right? Where the Europeans matter is on the economic front. And the question is whether or not the Europeans will cooperate with the United States to help the United States win the technological race with China. As I said a few questions back, there is this competition now taking place, intense competition, between the United States and China over leading ed edge technologies. This is a competition that matters enormously to the United States and to China as well. 
Now, the question is, will the Europeans cooperate with the Americans so as not to feed the growth of Chinese technologies? And I don't know what the answer is to that question. I think the Americans will go to great lengths to get the Europeans not to cooperate in terms of trade and investment and technological flows with China, right? But whether the Europeans go along is another matter. <coughs> Excuse me, and it may be possible to get the British and the French to go along, but not get the Germans to go along. So how this plays out remains to be seen. But I think the Europeans are very important to the United States, and by the way, very important to the Chinese, because they have the ability to help the Chinese economy grow by leaps and bounds if the Europeans cooperate. Our time is running out, and this is a fascinating discussion. Uh, Professor Mirsheimer, if you allow just the last uh, question, or well, it's two questions, uh, but they are on the similar topic and they bring us back to Russia. Uh, so Artem Kashedov uh, and Mikhail Polanski, they are asking about the U.S. policy. What should be the U.S. policy toward Russia? You underline that the U.S. should take measures to ally with Russia against China. In your opinion, what can the U.S. offer to the Russians in order to involve us in anti-Chinese alliance? And isn't it more beneficial for the Russians to ally with China? And as a follow-up, uh, Mikhail also asks uh, if he is right to assume that you would encourage Biden administration to give Russia the security gu guarantees it demands uh, regarding NATO non-expansion non and the denunciation of the alliance pledge given to Ukraine in, and Georgia in Bucharest in 2008. Uh, okay. I think just to start with the last question, uh, from a geopolitical or strategic point of view, it would be very smart for President Biden to tell President Putin that uh, the idea of Ukraine and Georgia uh, joining NATO is off the table. That's not going to happen. And that the United States and NATO uh, are interested in working out some sort of modus vivendi in Eastern Europe that is acceptable to the Russians and to our East European allies. That, that should be our policy. Is it politically possible for Biden to do that? No. Uh, he cannot explicitly say, I believe, uh, that uh, Ukraine and Georgia will not become part of NATO. Strategically, that's what should be said. But in terms of American domestic politics, given the Russophobia in the United States, which is off the charts, right? It's just not politically possible. But he should move in that direction. That should be our de facto policy. There's no question about that. We should go to great lengths to basically eliminate our security competition with Russia in Eastern Europe. That's the minimum. Now, to go to the first question, uh, what should American policy be vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia uh, in terms of China? The question implied that there were two possibilities for Russia. One is that Russia allies with the United States, or two, Russia allies with China. The smart policy for Russia, as both you, Igor, and you, Andre, taught me a number of years ago, is not to ally with either China or Russia, but instead to sit on the fence. The Russians have, in my opinion, and again, you two convinced me of this, the Russians have a vested interest in not getting in the middle of this fight, stay on the sidelines. I think that's true. I think, however, from an American point of view, the best thing that can happen 
is that as Chinese military power grows, it becomes in particular ways a threat to Russia. And in that case, the Russians will move closer to the Americans. And the Americans, of course, will have a vested interest in getting all the help they can get to contain China. So the Americans will have no problem cozying up to the Russians. But I think the Russians have no interest in cozying up to the Americans and allying with Washington absent some serious threat from China. In other words, if that doesn't materialize, I think the Russians will smartly stay on the sideline. But for now, I mean, what's happening is, if anything, the Americans, because of their foolish policy in Eastern Europe and their foolish policy with regard to Ukraine, are pushing the Russians to form closer relations with China, right? And as I said before, it's not just the Chinese, it's also the Iranians. The Russians, the Chinese, and the Iranians are all coming closer together. And the United States is talking about fighting three different wars against Iran, against Russia, against China. This is insanity, especially when you have a peer competitor in East Asia, which is China. I often say that if the American foreign policy establishment that we have now was in place in the early 1940s, instead of aligning with the Soviet Union against Nazi Germany, they would have gone to war against both Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. This was then the height of idiocy, right? Balance of power politics tells you that if you're dealing with a potential regional hegemon like China, you want to enlist all the countries around the world to help you contain that potential hegemon. And Russia is included, in my opinion, but we have not moved in that direction. I just wanted uh, to apologize for all the uh, participants who asked questions and we didn't manage to uh, ask them. We tried to squeeze as many as possible. And uh, Professor Mirshaimer was uh, very kind and uh, generous to answer all these questions which were firing at him from various directions. We only could hope that at some point in the future we will be able to uh, organize another meeting to ask these remaining questions. Uh, on behalf of Andre uh, and myself and all the participants, let us just thank uh, John Mirshaimer for spending the last hour and a half with us and sharing your great strategic insights. This is a great uh, treat and we are grateful for this. Uh, thank you for all the participants uh, and for all the audience and special thanks for people who helped us to organize it technically, including Igor Spirin for his uh, support of that. Thank you so much and uh, we are looking to next meetings. Thank Something. you, I enjoyed it greatly. Thank you, thank you Professor.